Um, I, I will be answering one of the questions from the, the big, big questions uh, that we do here in the, in the summer. Um, the question actually came from, I'm, I'm told it came from Jim Jackson. Um, and uh, I think he probably has a better answer than I do. But <laughs> I will do my best to, to answer this. Um, the question comes from Isaiah, and it's Isaiah uh, chapter 6, and this is actually the time where God calls Isaiah to ministry. Um, the, the book is not linear. Uh, Isaiah is all over the map time-wise. He, he talks about end times he talks about Christ it's it's the most profound uh, book of the Old Testament when it comes to Christ there's 330 prophecies about Christ alone in in Isaiah um, 110 of them were about his first coming 220 are about his second coming and uh, so it's it's just it's an amazing book uh, but this chapter 6 God calls him to minister and to and to speak truth to the nation of of Judah, um, the nation of Israel, the northern nation has already fallen, um, and so he's he's just talking to uh, specifically Jerusalem, but to the nation of Judah. So, uh, he, God said, "Go and tell this people." Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might, turn, might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. That's quite an indictment. <laughs> That's a tough word, and I got to say it's it's been a um, it's been a tough one to to process um, for myself as I've been studying this. Um, there's a lot here. There's a lot that that uh, God wants to reveal in our own in our own lives um, when we when we look at the Word, and um, and I, I want to step back in this in this chapter uh, to to verse five. Isaiah says, "Woe is me!" He's standing before the throne of God. He has he has a vision of God. He's standing there, and he's and he says, "Woe is me! I'm ruined. For I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips." And he, he doesn't know he doesn't know what to do and God God sends a um, seraphim uh, to touch his lips with a coal and and he says now you're clean and he burns burns away the sin and and he said and then God says um, whom shall I send and who will go for us. And I said, here am I, send me. That should be, that should be our response. Here am I, send me. He didn't know what God was gonna tell him. He just said, I'm willing, whatever, whatever it takes. And so the very first thing God tells him to say is that your, your ears are closed, your eyes are shut, you're not listening, you're hard-hearted, and, and you're in a, in a bad place. And, and this statement he will say, um, there's at least five times that he says this statement throughout, throughout Isaiah. Now there's hope towards the end of Isaiah, so it's not, it's not hopeless, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's a hard word. Um, but what does it mean? What does it mean? Otherwise, they might turn and be healed. Does God really not want us to be healed? Well, we'll, we'll get to that here. So, um, 
so time-wise, just a little bit of the context here. Time-wise, this is, this is about 700 BC. Now, uh, the king, king David and King Solomon um, were alive about 550 years before this. This was, this was the last time the country was unified, was under King Solomon. So um, they've, they've fallen a long ways in, in this time. In 550 years, um, we, we can't even perceive of that. We're, we're not even 250 years old as a nation, and we're looking at twice twice that um, they uh, they had fallen a long ways they were they were worshiping other idols uh, he, Isaiah spends one whole chapter talking about the idols that they're they're worshiping and how useless they are they are um, they are not taking care of the needy um, that's that's one of the one of the things that that he says over and over again that they they're not helping the poor and that they're not helping the the widows and the orphans and and it's it's quite an indictment against them that that uh, that they should be doing that um, it's another almost a hundred years before Jerusalem falls um, there are cities that are taken in the in the meantime but but this warning is is a hundred years before Jerusalem actually falls. So God is long suffering. Um, he 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 gives them a warning. He he sends Jeremiah later, and then Ezekiel. Uh, he continues to warn them that that uh, this is coming if you don't repent, and they don't. Um, so then. Uh, the the last part of this this statement by Isaiah in, in chapter six, uh, he says, "Then I, chap, uh, verse eleven. Then I said, for how long, O Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ru ruined and, and without inhabitant. And he goes on to to explain how how desolate. Israel is going to become and Jerusalem is going to become it's uh, like I say it's quite an indictment um, there are um, f five times in the New Testament that this verse is, is qu or this, this series of verses is quoted um, so it's an important thing for us to understand what does this mean uh, it's quoted by uh, Matthew, it's quoted by Mark, by John, it's quoted in Acts, which is, is probably Luke, and it's quoted in Romans, which is Paul. So, so we have five different authors who quote this verse. It's important that we, that we get a handle on what, what God's trying to tell us here. Um, so what were the, the things that were blocking the Israelites from, from seeing? He's not talking about physical sight, of course. He's talking about spiritual sight and, and spiritual hearing. What, what was blocking them? Um, and, and when you boil it down, there were two, two main things. And I, I said they were worshiping other idols and they weren't taking care of the needy. Isaiah 117, right, right at the beginning of the book, uh, Verse 17, he says, Seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the cause of the widow. He's, and he tells them this over and over again, that they need to be taking care of those who are needy. In the New Testament, Jesus was asked, um, and it, it, it may have been a legitimate question, it was by one of the Pharisees who came to him, and he was asked a question. Um, the question was, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? This is from Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Um, which is the greatest command? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. 
this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Just, just these two commandments. These were the two commandments that they were breaking. They were worshiping other idols, so they weren't honoring God. They weren't following God with all their heart. And they weren't loving their neighbor as themselves. They weren't taking care of the needy. They were breaking the two, two greatest commands. And just a side note, I like to think of the, um, when Moses brought down the, the Ten Commandments, they were on two tablets. I like to think of the first tablet as the first four commands, which have to do with honoring God, and the second as the last six commands, which have to do with honoring our, our neighbor. Um, not stealing, not lying, those all have to do with honoring each other. Um, it's, I don't know if that's the way it, it was written down, but I like to think of it that way, that, that they were two tablets, two commands broken into subsections. Um, so the, real quick here, the, the, the law um, was being Levitical law, when we, when we go back to the time of Moses, we, we have the Levitical law. The law had been twisted and, and turned into something that was impossible for the people to follow. And by, by the time Jesus was around, he, he chastised um, the Pharisees for their fake observance of the law. Um, they, a couple of the things that were very strange, but there were uh, the Sabbath day rest. There were certain knots that you could tie on the Sabbath and certain knots that you weren't allowed to tie. Just, just bizarre. Um, there was a certain distance you could walk on, on the Sabbath. Um, and there was another distance that you could walk if you were carrying something. Um, I mean, they just twisted and made, made things difficult. In New York today, there are um, wires that uh, are, are strung between um, phone, phone poles and power poles that define the distance that you can walk from the, te the uh, temples in, in New York where the, where the Jews live. And, and you, you can't walk beyond the line. And, the, and it's the duty of the, the junior um, uh, leaders who are studying to become, um, become the, uh, the rabbis, thank you, yeah. Um, it's their duty to make sure that these wires are maintained and, and kept uh, up to snuff. It's, it's a strange thing. Uh, and, and there were many, many more laws that were twisted in that way. And the law had become, Paul talks about the law of bringing death. That's part of it, was it was so twisted and, and impossible to follow. And so, um, so the, the, the Jews at this time were were doing some of the perfunctory things, some of the things that they were supposed to do, but they were also doing other things that they weren't supposed to be doing. And it was because they felt if I do the, if I do the right thing, I can do whatever else I want to. <laughs> and their hearts weren't right. They weren't honoring God. And, and that's, that's the heart of where, where he's getting, is that their hearts are, are wrong. They're, they're hard-hearted. Um, in James we read uh, James 2.14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Um, he's not saying that works is what's important. He's saying that, that our faith will lead to, to good, good works. It will, it will draw us to, to, to do the right thing. 
Um, and then 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? So the, the first question here that I have is how, how do we hear God? Um, as, uh, in this day, especially with young people, um, I, there, there's a lot of people that say, I, I, don't, I, I never hear God. I don't understand. How, how can you hear God? And that's, that's a great question. We, uh, we expect, I think part of the problem is our expectation. We expect God to speak plainly and clearly to us. Um, Lord, should I buy this car? Yes. That's the kind of answer we're looking for. But that's not the way God speaks to us usually. <laughs> usually. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he speaks clearly. But oftentimes he, he's, he's unclear. And, and I will say, um, God speaks differently to different people to give the same answer. Uh, Elaine and I will pray about something. She'll get, she'll get a picture um, or a vision of something um, that will explain it and a more of a metaphor or a parable. I'll get something completely different. I see structure and order and, and uh, those are the things I'm looking for as, a, as an engineer. Um, we get the same answer through different, different uh, pictures. Um, God's going to speak to each one of us differently. And, and quite often it's, it's through uh, some amount of, of uh, mystery or, or story or, or parable. Jesus spoke in parables. Uh, almost his whole ministry is, is covered in, in, the, in the parables that he spoke. Uh, he, he spoke clearly, occasionally with his own disciples, but when he was speaking to crowds, he used stories. Um, and I, I want to just cover one of those. Um, this is from Matthew 13, 10 through 15. He's just told the parable of the um, sower and the seeds. And I, I won't get into it, but it, it is about uh, a farmer sowing seeds and some of it falls into thorny ground, some into um, the birds take away, uh, but some falls into good, good ground. Okay, that's, there's, there's a meaning behind each of those places where the seed falls and he explains that. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? Why? He replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and he will, be, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. And then he quotes from Isaiah, Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, you will be ever hearing and never understanding, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They're hard hearted and that's why he's not revealing the word. That's why he speaks in parables so that if we're listening, we'll, we'll get it. The Spirit will reveal it to us. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to help us to understand. And if, we, if we're not listening, we won't get it. Um, so that's, that's hard to get because I, I like to explain things. I like to understand it clearly. And many of us do. But that's not the way God always talks to us. Um, One of the main ways God speaks to us is through his word, through the, the written word. We have his Bible. Um, it's important that we uh, 
look for answers in the word and it's important that we spend time in the word because um, that's the way he's going to speak one of the ways he's going to speak to us is through his word um, and one one more this is a kind of a funny story uh, Pastor Larry brought this up last week There, there's a story with Moses and his brother and sister Aaron and Miriam and Aaron and Miriam are are kind of whining about the fact that God's using Moses so much to speak to the people and and they be, begin to talk against Moses and the thing they bring up is that he's uh, he's married a Cushite wife that's not really their problem but but that's he didn't marry a Jewish wife and and uh, so they're they're whining about that and um, and they said has the Lord spoken only through Moses they asked hasn't he also spoken through us and the Lord heard this so the so the, the Lord calls them to task and says come here <laughs> And they come into the tent of meeting, and and he says, "Come forward." And and this is this is what he tells Aaron and Miriam: When a prophet of the Lord is among you, like like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, um, there, when a prophet is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions; I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Now, that's, that's pretty profound that God is speaking directly and, he, and Moses even gets to see, see the form of God. Um, pretty amazing. Uh, three verses earlier there's a note here that says Moses was a very humble man more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth I think that's part of the answer is that in, in his humility God was able to speak clearly to him and I, I can attest to this that, that uh, it is very easy when God speaks to us or when God uses us to become prideful um, especially if you speak something clearly. Well, God told me, <laughs> or God did did this through me. It's really easy to to become prideful in that. Moses was was beyond that. He still was a man, and he still stumbled. He still failed, as we all do. But he was he he didn't need to to have God speak to him mysteries. God spoke to him plainly. And if God speaks to you plainly, then praise God. <laughs> that's, um, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I can say I, I've never heard the audible voice of God. Um, my wife Elaine has. And that's okay. That's, I, I, I know a few that have, and, and I think most of us don't hear the audible voice, but God still speaks. Um, so then the second part of this is how do we um, see God? Um, again, I think very few of us ever actually see the form of God like Moses did. Um, but Jesus said uh, in John 5.19, Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. So Jesus, in his human form, is, is looking to see what his Father's doing around him. I think that's important for us to look and, and try to understand what God is doing around us. Sometimes God is speaking to our neighbors and we need to pay attention Sometimes people around us are going through a hard time and 
and it's a good opportunity for us to speak truth and speak comfort and, and love to them. I think we can wait and see what God is doing and ask God to reveal to us what he's doing um, and be more effective than if we're just uh, just either doing nothing or or not sure what we should be doing and so we do everything. I think sometimes we overwhelm ourselves with trying to do too much because we don't know what what God's doing. If we know what God's doing and get involved with it, I think we can be much more effective. And that that may, like I say, it may be a neighbor, it could, could be our children, it could be um, someone close to us, a relative. Uh, if we see what God's doing in their life, we can speak uh, what God needs us to speak more, more easily. Another way to see God is to, is to be thankful. Uh, and I think sometimes this, this can be hard to, to give thanks when things are hard, when things are when we're frustrated about things. Um, but we're told, be joyful. This is First Thessalonians 5. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. As we give thanks to God for what he's done, for who he is, for, for what he will do, um, we gain an understanding, and we, I think... We, we have a sense of seeing God in things, in what's, what's going on around us. And worship is a, is a great way of, of seeing God, it, similar to, to thanking him. We, we give worship to God. Um, Jesus said, a time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. So what's the benefit of, of hearing and seeing God? Um, we're, we're forgiven when we, when we see and hear God. Um, we, we humble ourselves and, and we're forgiven. In, um, in Mark, this is another instance where this Isaiah scripture is interpreted and Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. This is uh, Mark 4.9. Um, and then in verse 12, he says, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Um, so the opposite of that is if they do see and hear, um, they, will, they will be forgiven. Um, that's the converse of that. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? <laughs> um, his disciples are frustrated. They didn't get the, they didn't understand it, but they were asking. And it's okay to be frustrated and ask God <laughs> to explain something. Um, and he did explain it. But we need to... Um, need to to try and see and hear God um, and, and humble ourselves before him. Um, so let's, so to the big, the big question here is the, the last part of this. Otherwise they might turn and be healed. The question is, does God want this? Does he want people not to, not to be healed? Um, I'm going to read a few other scriptures here that, that are times when God either hardened someone's heart or, or caused a delusion. And um, from Exodus 9, um, and that's actually quite a few times God does this, uh, but this, at this time, the magicians 
could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and on all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said to Moses. So over and over again, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Um, and the purpose was that eventually uh, he would uh, he would relent, but even in that, he 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 loses his army because because he continues to harden his heart, and God punishes him. Um, Isaiah again twenty nine. 10, the Lord has brought over you a deep sleep. He has sealed your eyes, the prophets. He has covered your heads, the seers. And then in verse 13, the Lord says, These people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. This gets back to the law. They were just, just following the rules. Their heart wasn't for God. And then getting to the New Testament, um, I think it's important that we see God's character is the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and so when we see something in the Old Testament, we can probably find the same character of God in the New Testament. So in the last days, this is Romans 1.24. Um, in the last days, therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts. So God gives them over because of their sin. Uh, verse 26, he says it again. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Huh? <laughs> God's wanting them to, to wallow in their shameful lusts? No, that's not what he's saying. And then verse 28 again. He gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. He's given them over to do sinful things. He doesn't want that. Not at all. It's not God's desire that people sin. But, and this is the key, the, the wages of sin is death. Paul says that. If that's true, and it is, Sin always leads to some some form of death. It it brings suffering of some kind, and it's a guarantee that sin will bring will bring suffering. the The purpose for that is that when we feel the sting of of that death or that suffering from sin, that we'll turn back to God. That's God's heart, is that he wants us to turn back. It's never that we, that we die in our sin. It's that, it's that we turn back. Uh, God is gracious. God loves us. He, he, he wants us to turn back to him. And, and he continues to tarry until, until the last um, soul is one for him that will be one. Uh, we, we know that in the last days. God loves us, and he, he, he doesn't want us to suffer, but sometimes that's the only way if we continue to, uh, to follow a path of, of destruction. The only way is for us to suffer the, the pain of that. So back to Isaiah, he brings... He brings hope, and and Jesus does too. But Isaiah, again, like I said, he he speaks of Christ and Christ coming. Uh, there's 110 prophecies about Christ. Uh, that is the hope for the Israelites that that there a king will come. Um, in Isaiah 35, three through six. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. God will, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer. 
and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. This is a reference to, to Christ coming. Your God will come. <laughs> Psalm, uh, Psalms 51, di after David had sinned, uh, he cried out to God. He said, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to, to sustain me. That's the, that's the point God wants us to come to is crying out to him. And David was broken and, and he cried out to God. Jesus paid the price for our sin. He died on the cross for our sin so that we don't have to suffer the consequences. That, that requires us to come to him and ask for forgiveness. And we can't We can't take that lightly, the, the cost of that. We, we, we celebrate communion often because it reminds us of the, of the cost of, of that sacrifice. The, the Jews took uh, what God had done for them lightly. God had, had delivered them from the Egyptians. He had he had done many things for them. He had uh, grown them into a great nation under, under David, under Solomon. They were a great nation and, and they continued to be for, for a while. Uh, he had given them many things. He gave them victory time, time after time. He gave them victory over their enemies. Um, they took those things lightly and they lost sight of those things. When we lose sight of what, what God has done for us we, and start to take, take those things lightly, uh, we, we can fall into um, just doing the right thing, just trying to, to do the minimum <laughs> and not knowing God. God wants us to come to him and know him. He wants us to, to know his heart, to become uh, his servants and... Um, as I didn't read here. Um, yeah, let's, let's pray. Um, I think I want to in, encourage you that it's God's heart is that we come uh, and know him more. It's not that we, that we just do the right things. Doing, doing the right thing will become easy if we're serving God. It will be second nature. Um, th and there will be temptations, there will be struggles. That's, that's our human nature. And Paul... <laughs> Paul talks about that, that, that there's always, always that tension uh, while we're here on earth. But he sent the Holy Spirit as comforter. He sent, sent the Spirit to help us to, to walk through tough things. He, he wants to help us. He wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to speak to us us to see what he's doing. He wants us to, to become, um, he said, take, take up your cross and follow me. And that's, that's a tough word also. Uh, 
years, there's a cost to following him. But he makes, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And, and he makes it easy by the power of the Spirit. And, and he wants us to... Thank you. 